everyone. Welcome everyone uh, to, to this uh, month's uh, Lunch and Learn uh, with the Anticoagulation uh, Forum. I'm uh, Scott Cates. I get the uh, pleasure of presenting some very exciting and very new uh, research uh, today. As a reminder, like with all of our webinars, feel free to type in questions if you uh, have them. Um, and I'm joined by a great panel. I'm going to bring up their uh, pictures in a moment and introduce those. Um, and thanks uh, to them. So Panud Bikdeli is um, at uh, Women's uh, Hospital and Harvard Medical School, Brigham and Women's in uh, Boston. Uh, he and I are just uh, meeting, so you're going to hear me uh, talk with some of my other dear colleagues and, uh, and friends here, but it, it's a pleasure to uh, share the, we'll say, quote, podium and stage uh, with you, uh, Benoud. Um, I'm Scott Cates. I'm a hospitalist at Henry Ford in uh, Detroit and the past president of AC Forum. Patrick Lawler and I have been able to uh, starting to get to know each other. He is up at Toronto General uh, Hospital. Um, he helped lead some of the trials that we're going to uh, talk about today. I was site investigator for one of those. That's how Patrick and I have uh, uh, gotten to know each other. Renato Lopez is a, a dear colleague and friend. He's a, a past board member of uh, Anticoagulation um, uh, Forum. He's down at Duke right now, but he also does a lot of work in Brazil. And he actually created the Brazilian uh, uh, Clinical Research uh, Institute. And so Renato was just thrilled to see the action trial come out and coming out of that network. Uh, congratulations, my friend. And then uh, Tracy uh, Manchao uh, just finished on the uh, board of anticoagulation uh, forum. She's at uh, UC uh, San Francisco as a uh, is a uh, generalist like I am. Uh, does a lot of thrombosis and runs the thrombosis service in uh, San Francisco. And as a plug, that's where our fall meeting will be. So next slide, please. So here are disclosures. I'll leave these up just for a moment. And reminder, we'll be actively monitoring the chat. So feel free to put your questions in um, as we go along. Next slide. So here's how you get credit. And I think this slide will be up at the end also. So you'll have a reminder of that. Next slide, please. Great. So I have the very difficult task of trying to prevent present three trials with four manuscripts in a rapid enough time so we can encompass all of this and have lots of time for discussion. So I'm gonna do my best. So this is very high level stuff. Slides will be made available. You have QR codes on the bottom of all of these slides if you want to make it easy to bring up the article if you'd like to do this. And let's just talk, look at the top panel here for a moment. And the little round dots that you see in there is these are the SARS-CoV-2 uh, uh, virus. And as they get into the alveoli, you're looking at the, uh, the alveoli. What they'll do is it will start to kick off an inflammatory process. And I think very early in the stage, i.e. in the first several weeks or maybe month of the pandemic, we thought that this was an alveolar in just a long lung disease, at least from an airspace uh, disease. But if you look at the bottom now, what we get is that we get progressive inflammation. And we all know there's tremendous inflammation with uh, COVID-19. You get this yellow stuff, that's the pulmonary edema. So that makes sense. If you get a lot of edema, now it's hard for the oxygen molecule to swim through all of that. And then it's got to hike across the interstitium now in between the alveoli and the capillary. And of course that's inflamed. And so that's getting, um, that's getting clogged up and in thicker. But what I think we started to appreciate very early in the pandemic is you were getting this microthrombus now, this capillary thrombosis. And so what we really have is maybe some of the hypoxemia isn't just what's happening into the alveoli, but you have this immunomicrothrombus. And that explains a lot on how the trials that our three guests are, have been done a spectacular job in studying this to see if we can prevent that thrombosis so that we can get better oxygenation. Next slide, please. If we look at this series of seven autopsies out of the New England Journal from May of this year, 
Over on the left is the normal lacy capillary pattern that we see that engulfs the, uh, the alveolus. On the right, you don't have to be a histologist to understand that that doesn't look good and that those capillaries are torn up. Next slide, please. If we then do staining and actually sort of try to do a cast of those, on the right, you see a normal lung. The blue is the airway. The sort of clumps down in the bottom on the uh, uh, panel D is the alveolar uh, cluster of grapes. And then you see the red is the uh, microvasculature coming down. Uh, the capillaries come out from that. On the left is a casting from a COVID-19 uh, patient. And what you see on the red is you don't see a nice smooth open cap uh, microvasculature. It almost looks like almost the filling defect if you would from a CAT scan looking for a pulmonary embolism. And if you stain that, that's all thrombosis. So really we started to learn quite early in the pandemic that we also, we knew we had the big clots, the DVTs, PEs, the little bit of stroke and myocardial infarction we knew about, the clogging of dialysis uh, uh, catheters we knew about. What we then started to realize is that we also had microclots. And I think this is key to how we are approaching anticoagulation, or at least how I'm approaching anticoagulation in the COVID patient. Next slide, please. So here is a um, is sort of a layout, and I'm going to sort of tell you how I've incorporated these into my practice. And then we're going to have the people that actually designed and ran the trials to tell me if I'm right. So we have examples, just examples. There's many, many trials ongoing. But in the top, if we start on the left hand, if you look down in the middle column, I have pre-hospitalization labeled there. So the patient's at home. It's really curious now, if we have this microclotting, should we start with an anticoagulant very upstream in the process, i.e. before the patient's even sick enough to be in the hospital? And there's a couple of trials that are ongoing, Active 4C, that is an NIH-sponsored trial, that's with a Pixaban. Prevent is sponsored by Janssen with Rivaroxaban. I'm uh, putting patients in at my site into that uh, trial. And so trying to answer is upstream makes sense. However, the guidelines, third, um, third row down, uh, are recommending not routinely prophylaxing the patient. And I don't do that um, either. The only way I do it is by putting a patient into a trial. The next then, the completed trials, and I've put ATTACK, Active 4A, and remap cap all in the same color, is that those trials all combine together. I'm gonna let Dr. Lawler talk a little bit about how they did that. It was a spectacular how the world came together to attack uh, this virus and, uh, and ramp up the uh, science but they, um, they came together. And those trials are complete. And those are gonna be the only positive trials that I'm going to uh, show and that we're gonna discuss uh, today. Those are for patients that were on the hospital floor, not in the critical care unit. The ACTION trial also led by Dr. Lopez. And Renato, just to let you know, I've lumped this into the hospital floor because I know although you recruited ICU patients, about 90% of the patients in that trial were on the floor. So I've lumped them there for um, convenience. And we can go into some of those uh, details during the uh, discussion. That was comparing. So in that trial, we now know the three trials that were combined, we have saw that therapeutic anticoagulation was better. And so even though the ASH guidelines, I just picked ASH guidelines, there's lots and lots of guidelines out there, are still recommending prophylactic dose. I've moved and my hospital has moved to using therapeutic dose based on the preprints of these trial uh, results. If we go to the ICU, the three multi-platform trials that combined their uh, data and their methods and their outcome ascertainment, those we, there were two cohorts in the ICU and not in the ICU. And of those, the cohort in the ICU, however, did not get an advantage in the ICU. 
And then uh, inspiration trial also with Dr. Bicdelli, who's gonna discuss that. That was an ICU only trial. They looked at intermediate dose um, heparin compared to prophylactic dose and it didn't help um, either. It's really interesting when I had COVID, I started out on the floor and I got prophylactic dose. We now know that I should have gotten therapeutic dose. We didn't know at that time. When I moved to the ICU, we upped our game as everybody was thinking. It was the same thing I was doing with patients. We upped the game to intermediate dose. That doesn't work uh, either. So it's really interesting how we had to learn what we're doing. And this is almost upside down on what we were expecting. So I see use prophylactic doses of guidelines and that's what I'm uh, using. And then being discharged from uh, to home, the active 4B is an NIH sponsored uh, trial. It's recruiting patients after uh, hospital discharge uh, to right now um, prophylactic dose of Pixaban. They're also gonna have a therapeutic dose and an aspirin dose in that trial, I think. Post-discharge, no prophylaxis is the guidelines. And I'm not giving routine prophylaxis, but I am giving sometimes prophylaxis just like I would with any other sick medical patient. And we've had uh, rivaroxaban has been approved for about a year and a half for that population, as has a betrixaban, but betrixaban is not uh, commercially available. Next slide, please. So I hope that sort of level sets this. Now let me go very quickly at very high level into the, um, into the uh, trials, just to set this stage for everybody. So the inspiration trial, I'm putting these in order of full publication, um, is intermediate dosing effective in the uh, intensive care unit. It's a randomized trial, open label, it's a two by two design, also had a statin arm, we're not gonna discuss that uh, today. 562 patients in 10 Iranian academic uh, centers, ICUs, July to November. And I'm going to give you the dates on when the patients came in because we know that certainly the mortality rates, thankfully, in this pandemic have, uh, be, uh, have been uh, dropping. Some of that, of course, is who's getting sick with this as well as the uh, vaccines roll out. The intervention, although this is intermediate dose, and I'm used to thinking of intermediate dose as sort of anoxaparin 40 twice a day, that's what I got when I was in the ICU, is that here the investigator used anoxaparin one milligram per kilogram once a day. And then there were adjustments for obesity and for renal failure, although not very many of the patients needed those adjustments. And the control was a usual, I think we're very familiar with 40 milligrams once a day with similar adjustments. The outcome was a composite of venous thromboembolic disease, arterial thromboembolisms. I think it's very appropriate to put that in. I have to still, I catch myself in saying I'm giving a patient anticoagulant there um, on the floor. I'm a hospitalist. And I have to say, I'm not necessarily preventing a VTE, although I slip. I'm preventing, I hope, some of this microthrombus and some of these arterial events. So arterial events uh, were in there. ECMO in all-cause mortality time frame was 30 days. Next slide, please. So just highlighting some of these busy graph, I'll take you to blue outlighted on, uh, on top is the composite endpoint. The next column over is you'll see intermediate dose versus standard dose, 45.7, 44.1. You don't have to be a statistician to say there's no difference there. We look at all cause mortality, they're similar, 43 and 40%. If we look at venous thromboembolism, no different, 3.3 and 3.5. If we come down to major bleeding, two and a half versus 1.4, so a little higher, but not statistically significant, more heparin, more bleeding makes sense. But where we really see where we start to skirt on the, um, on the statistical significance with a traditional p-value of 0.05 of 6.2 for composite of major and non-major bleeding versus 3.1%. Uh, so no benefit and a little signal towards possibly uh, some harm with uh, bleeding, mostly in the uh, uh, non-major clinically relevant. Next slide, please. The action trial. Now, the question is therapeutic, uh, prophylactic anticoagulation. I, that should, um, therapeutic, prophylactic anticoagulation 
primarily with rivaroxaban. Now, not looking at a low molecular weight heparin, but looking at a uh, DOAC, better than usual prophylactic dose. It's a randomized open label trial, 615 patients, so similar size to what we uh, saw with inspiration. COVID-19, elevated D-dimer. So looking at those patients that we think are at higher risk with an elevated uh, D-dimer, 31 Brazilian sites, June to February of this year. Therapeutic dose rivaroxaban, Xarelto, <coughs> excuse me, in this country, 20 milligrams, adjust that appropriately to 15 milligrams uh, if the creatinine clearance is in that range. And here, a little different, treat all the patients for 30 days. And then on patients that were um, unstable, they used heparin until the patients were stable initially and then finished out the days with uh, rivaroxaban compared to prophylactic dose, uh, noxaparin or heparin for patients with uh, renal failure. A hierarchical composite of time to death, duration of hospitalization and duration of oxygenation and time frame for 30 days. Next slide, please. Renato, if we have time, we can go back to the primary analysis. I still got to get used to win ratios. I didn't want to detract from our conversations and clinical conversations, so we can maybe come back to this. But next slide, please. But I'll show you a little more uh, uh, traditional uh, reporting that we're used to. Again, this paper just came out in uh, Lancet. The composite of thrombotic outcomes, 7% versus 10% with therapeutic versus prophylactic, no difference with a p-value of 0.32. VTE, 4% versus uh, uh, 6%, no difference. No difference in uh, mortality, 11 uh, versus uh, 8. But the major bleeding uh, rate, with major or clinically relevant non-major bleeding, with very standardized definitions using the International Society on Thrombosis and Hemostasis, was four times higher, approximately 8% versus uh, 2%. So no benefit but harm with uh, bleeding. Next slide, please. Now we're going to get into the um, uh, into uh, the three combined multi-platform trials. If you look up in the uh, top left here, you can see the ATT&CK trial, the remap cap, and the active uh, for um, A trials. Uh, really sort of primarily uh, run out of Canada with ATT&CK, uh, the UK with remap cap, and the active for A NIH, uh, primarily in the US. Brilliant how they all came together to pool this. Then there were really three, there were two major groups of patients, those that had critical illness and non-critical illness. Now it's because it's called severe and moderate when we're doing the trial. When I say critically ill, what we're going to mean is not a place. Because remember last December, I saw pictures on the news of, you know, in Los Angeles where they were doing ICUs in parking structures. So we're going to talk about is the patient traditionally need to be in the ICU. If I say ICU, we're talking about critical illness. And critical illness in these trials was defined as either needing high flow nasal uh, oxygen, about 20 liters or north mechanical ventilation with or without an endotracheal tube, ECMO or vasopressor or inotrope uh, support. So all of the patients in this cohort, and we randomized them either when they were in the ICU or when the patients were on the floor and they were analyzed uh, in, independently, a priori. And what we found in the, in the critically ill patients, there was no difference. Now, what we're going to measure, and I think this is very important because we're not measuring just macro clots here. We're not measuring venous thromboembolic disease, DVT-PE, or MI or stroke. What we're measuring is support-free days, days that you didn't need high flow oxygen, mechanical ventilation, vasopressor support, or ECMO. So that's what we're looking at and it's counted. So it's a little different analysis. And what we found is the patients that started out needing uh, support, they had a median, 
I almost said average, which would be wrong, a median of three days of organ support free days. So you got them off of uh, this critical illness uh, that they needed and a lot of those patients would come out of the ICU versus five days with usual care. Now a caveat to usual care, because this was open label, trying to do all these trials in the midst of a pandemic, about 41% of those patients had prophylactic anticoagulant and about 51% had what we would call an intermediate dose getting closer to what uh, the INSPIRATION trial uh, looked at. This study, this arm was stopped early because there was a 99.8% chance that there was futility, that there was never going to be a benefit of therapeutic anticoagulation. So rightfully so, let's stop putting the patients in. Let's put our efforts in now to the patients that are not critically ill and let's get an answer faster. And then what's interesting is there's an 89% probability because you've noticed the numbers are going in the wrong way here, that there was was maybe even uh, it was worse than usual care. So that's a critically uh, ill um, uh, population. I think the press release came out from the NIH, I think on December 22nd. And by Christmas, I think most ICU doctors had stopped using therapeutic uh, doses. Next slide, please. Here is where the action is. This is in the non-critically ill. Is therapeutic anticoagulation better than usual care? Same trial that I've already described, the three multi-platform trials, over 2,200 uh, patients in this. They uh, do, are not getting any of those critical ill components that I just uh, described. They're uh, in hospital within 72 hours. I put ish there because three protocols, they were all just a little bit uh, different, but, but, but I think close enough to certainly pool. Therapeutic anticoagulation with low molecular weight heparin and 94% of the time it was there, we were using unfractionated heparin for the patients with renal failure. The usual care, just like we saw in the other population, 71% was low dose and about 26% or about a quarter intermediate dose. Organ support free days that I've uh, discussed and um, the time frame was 21 days for organ support, 90 days uh, out to uh, death, and the time frame was to treat for 14 days. Next slide, please. This is still in preprint, okay, so it hasn't been peer uh, uh, reviewed and uh, published yet, but the Major first bullet point, first sub bullet, 76% of the patients that were getting usual care remained, if you will, without needing organ uh, support. And that was improved by 4.6% if the patients received therapeutic dose, primarily low molecular weight heparin. And then what was curious and what I thought when, when, uh, when we started uh, talking to patients about uh, uh, volunteering to be in this trial, I figured D-dimer, the higher your D-dimer, the more anticoagulation you're going to need. And if you get critically ill, then you're really going to get a lot of anticoagulation. And I saw lots of people do that. Prophylactic on the floor, intermediate dose in the ICU, and then, or even jumping up to a therapeutic dose. And I saw a lot of folks doing intermediate dose, even on the floor, if D-dimers were high. It didn't shake out that way. Although a little bit more benefit if the D-dimer was more than two times uh, upper limit of normal, not a uh, lot uh, there. So next slide. So, and then if we look at sort of proportion of patients that on the left here, organ support or death, uh, left is, is uh, usual care, right is therapeutic dose, lower is better. You can see the trends a little bit uh, uh, graphically here. Next slide, please. So everybody, I tried to do that in 20 minutes. I was talking fast. I'm at 25 minutes, but uh, pretty close. Uh, Tracy, I'm going to uh, let you start moderating questions that came if you would, and let's bring everybody back up on screen and we'll keep the slides down so we can have a nice discussion here. And I guess I would uh, like to start first uh, with, uh, with each of the uh, leads of the papers and see if you have anything else to add to my flying really fast uh, synopsis. So Manu, why don't we start with you? 
Of course, thanks so much, Scott, and the excellent summary of all the nuances and complexities of these trials. So as far as inspiration is concerned, as you exactly say, at the time that we were designing, there was lots of enthusiasm about intermediate dosing. And really, it's not as well defined as fully therapeutic or fully prophylactic dosing. And we had lots of back and forth discussions. Ultimately, the consensus was the regimen that we chose, which for the most part was one meg per kg per day of enoxaparin would be uh, the way to go. And of course, we were disappointed to see the results, but we were happy that this helped inform practice because it, it's something that was very widely used before the inspiration results came out. Well, and congratulations because we learned so much with very well done negative trials. Because it tells us what we shouldn't do. And there was a lot of consternation on uh, what to uh, do with this. So uh, uh, spectacular. I'll, I'll go in order in which I presented the uh, studies, Renato. Sure, Scott, a great summary. Um, a difficult topic, difficult field. I think we are still learning. I don't think we have all figured out yet. Um, in terms of subgroups, in terms of agents, in terms of dosing. I think we're getting there uh, better than we were a year ago, but I think we still have uh, some ways to go. But nonetheless, the rationale behind the action was that lots of people were using NOAX because it's easy, because people you know, have a very strong, we have very strong data for VTE uh, in, with rivaroxaban. And a lot of people were also continuing these drugs after hospital discharge. And also uh, we are seeing reports of people dying suddenly three, two weeks after COVID uh, hospitalization. So based on um, biological plausibility, we felt that, okay, maybe the prothrombotic status is not over when you are discharged. And maybe it's worthwhile continuing this treatment longer after hospital discharge for at least, we again, we guessed 30 days. And I think that was another unique aspect of action. So first is the DOAC that was compared. So most trials are looking at heparin. And these are different agents in terms of anticoagulation uh, therapies. So uh, we use DOAC. We aim to have uh, basically moderate patients that could actually swallow the, the pill, which yes. we end up with 92%. And we also wanted to cover the prolongation, the 30 day use even after hospital discharge. And I think we gave a very clear answer that this strategy with this agent at this dose does not work and only cause bleeding with numerically higher mortality rates, uh, which we've seen also in, in the action study. So again, I think we, we gave a very clear answer for the use of no acts, I would say in this clinical setting. I agree, and, and I'm going to extrapolate the, this rivaroxaban data to the other uh, DOACs as, as well. That's personally how I'm going to uh, take this. Yeah, I was actually happy that they, if you look at the conclusion in the Lancet, uh, they would have, they allowed us to actually, uh, I put a comment on any DOAC. Yeah, 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 I, I know, and, I saw it, and, I liked and, it. And I, and I was happy with that. That would have never happened in the New England Journal of Medicine, but right. I think that's appropriate because again, first, it's very likely that is true for other NOACs. And second, the other NOACs trials likely are not going to be existing to show that. Yeah. Patrick. Uh, thanks. A phenomenal and, and incredible privilege to have the opportunity to discuss the science um, with such a distinguished panelist, uh, obviously, um, series, as well as also with what looks like a great number of attendees. Um, it was an exciting trial for us to do too, as you say, I think um, Scott very early on was one of the engines, I think, for kind of pulling some of these ideas together and getting the protocol on paper. Um, and then I think from there, the partnership with some of the trials that we worked with was a great integration that really accelerated evidence generation and hopefully also extended external generalizability of the results in the end to multiple countries, I think in total 13 involved in uh, the MPRCT as Scott outlined. Definitely some differences from, I think, the trials that you've heard. I think the severe um, anticoagulation group probably did have a lot of similarity to um, what we heard from inspiration. And I think the results are quite concordant with what we saw from inspiration. And of course, about two thirds of a therapeutic dose given in that intermediate dose range in inspiration. And then, um, you know, obviously no, no net benefit at all in the uh, sick, critically ill patients. In contrast on the ward, our approach to, was a little bit different than what Renato outlined in action. We used a shorter course. We thought we'd target the early initial part of the hospitalization. So we needed patients to be in the hospital for less than 72 hours. 
And we chose heparin because we thought there might be pleiotropic effects. It has both antiviral effects, perhaps, uh, and here impairing the ability of the um, spike receptor protein to interact with the human ACE2 host receptor, as well as downregulating IL-6 and some other anti-inflammatory effects. Obviously, as cardiologists, we think a lot about those anti-inflammatory effects too. So we had sort of gotten to it from those kind of mechanisms and had taken that approach. A lot of people ask us why we didn't look at thrombosis as part of the primary outcome. And we were an open label trial. We were worried about ascertainment bias. And also we had the sense that this was primarily being given exactly as Scott outlined to prevent organ failure and to prevent the requirement for organ support. So in turn, our outcome reflected organ support as well as um, survival to hospital discharge. A shorter follow-up than Renato outlined as well. We were only focused on inpatients and just up to 21 days or so. Um, and we also uh, looked, as I say, at a um, sort of a slightly different population of patients. Um, obviously, uh, action had a little bit more variability in whom they allowed to be um, a trial, which I thought was a really terrific design. And uh, we narrowed the lens just a little bit further, and perhaps that may have contributed to some of the differences in the results that we had seen. Um, but uh, an incredible, uh, some incredible questions already coming through in the um, in the chat. So I thanks for the privilege. I'm looking forward to talking about them. Yeah. Okay, great. Thanks, everyone. All right, Scott, that was a fantastic presentation and review of a lot of information in a short period of time, which only you seem to be able to do. Um, okay, so I'm gonna start with um, uh, kind of a, a, I think one of the burning questions. Um, I think people some are having difficulties getting their head around why potentially full dose anticoagulation would be helpful in the patient who's on the ward and not in the ICU. Yeah. Um, and so just one question broadly is, what do you think is responsible for that? Then I'm going to ask each of you to tell me what you would do with a patient who was admitted to the ward in your um, institution. So that's just the, the warning ahead of time. So why do you think this is what we are seeing in, um, in that difference? Because I think, as you mentioned, this was upside down from what we had expected to see. Scott, you want to, you, you can any, start and then we'll go Scott, um, Benud, Patrick, and what on. Oh, well, and I already mentioned, we, we, we not only uh, changed and we're using therapeutic anticoagulation, I started pushing for that shortly after the uh, press release. Now, as an investigator, you get to see and be on the investigator calls, so you get a little more uh, deeper than the uh, press releases, but we changed actually our, our, our policy in the hospital. I think we're, uh, there's still some trepidation. We're eagerly awaiting the uh, full manuscript. <laughs> I'm sure not, not as much as Patrick, but almost as much as Patrick <laughs> to see those uh, in uh, print. But that's what I'm doing. It, it's pretty standard for me. If you need oxygen, and I'm a hospitalist and not a critical care doc, and you're on the floor, you're uh, really getting three things. You're getting steroids, remdesivir, and uh, therapeutic uh, dose uh, heparin, uh, primarily low molecular weight. Okay, Benud? Uh, that's a great question, thanks so much. Uh, so, so my take, I think one of the major lessons in the pandemic, Tracy, was even if we are able to see risk, targeting the risk necessarily with simplistic measures may, may not confer benefits. It's similar cases what happened in CAS trials. You were seeing a bunch of PVCs in post-MI patients. We suppressed it with antiarrhythmics, it didn't help. Maybe more of the same phenomenon here. And I think really the nuances are gonna be in the patient population, where they present, when they present, is it early on or later phases, and then how we're gonna use different agents. Specifically speaking at this point, you're not using therapeutic dose anticoagulation for ICU patients anymore. Floor patients, obviously, Patrick's study contributed a lot in how we would be more confident in, uh, in how other uh, practices are using therapeutic dose anticoagulation. And intermediate, I think there is no point in trying it unless people are being randomized in another trial. So are you putting your patients on full dose anticoagulation on the board? Uh, I, th I think that's a very reasonable thing to do. Of course, we are all super enthusiastic to see the peer-reviewed paper. And with, within those limits of seeing the preprint, I think it's very reasonable to discuss within the team and make a decision collectively. Okay, so it sounds like you're saying case by case and Scott is saying it's pretty much a, a policy. Is that right so far? Well, it's certainly my practice. Okay, your practice. Okay, Patrick. Thanks, Tracy. And can you um, can you also comment on why you think you're seeing this difference um, 
between uh, ward patients and ICU patients with regards to a response to full dose anticoagulation? Superb question, absolutely. And it really gets to the heart of the issue. I, so one of the things that we, I think, you know, it sort of was most clinically evident to us that this was a group that had a high occurrence of thrombosis in the ICU because that's where the frequency was just so elevated. Um, but really, by the time we get to that point, I think of having large vessel thrombosis detectable up, up to 30% of patients or so, really reached a patient who's very, very late in that thromboinflammatory cascade. And it may just be that the effects of heparin um, are just too small at that point. Uh, both the antithrombotic may be inadequate to overcome a large thrombus burden, as well as the anti-inflammatory effects at that point also may be too, too weak to, um, to mute what is a large systemic inflammatory response driving that immunothrombotic response. Um, and it may just be that the disease is too, too sort of advanced from that perspective. It's also the case in a lot of other critical care trials that patients at some point start, stop suffering from the initial insult but start to uh, respond to the organ failure and the extent of other organ injury. And a lot of the inflammatory response to that can be from organ dysfunction, organ failure, and doing something to the primary disease at that point is less effective. So I think it, in this case, to me, it looks like it's a better prevention than it is as a treatment targeting patients that are obviously requiring hospitalization. So they're in the hospital, the disease is active, these mechanisms are all at play, but they're not yet at the point where they're just having such large vessel thrombosis everywhere, systemic inflammation on the ventilator, and that they're not gonna to respond to these treatments. So um, at, at that point, once you sort of stop achieving the benefit and you're just accruing the risk, then I could certainly see that there would be not much of a signal in the ICU population. Mm -hmm. Definitely. What am I doing in my practice? I do use it in patients in the moderate state that are hospitalized. Um, there's a great question in the chat that came through from Rita Selby about D-dimer. And I think it's a great comment that we really didn't see significant differences in the treatment effect by D-dimer on a relative basis. In contrast, absolute risk did differ. And the survival to hospital discharge in patients with a D-dimer less than twofold, the relative upper range for a site, it was 95%. So there are a lot of patients that will actually do quite well even with usual care. And so you can really individualize that risk benefit discussion, I think not just by looking at the relative risk but at the absolute risks. Um, and so I would say that although I do rec would recommend it in all patients provided their bleeding risk isn't high, I'd particularly recommend it in patients that have a high D-dimer or other risk factors. I don't think it's D-dimer specifically that's indicating a pathway effect here of this, what we thought it might be, but I don't think so. I think it's more just other risk surrogates because we see the same thing when we look at other risk markers. All right, thanks. And Renato, what are you doing in, uh, well, you will, your work in multiple institutions, but in the two, the two places that you uh, spend most of your time clinically, what yeah, are you no, doing? Great, com great, great comments from everyone. I just wanted to say a few things. So the, the, I think the confusion comes because what, what the platform showed is, a, is basically against the principles that we all see in treatment effects in cardiology interventions or in any interventions, which is, the highest is the risk, the highest is the benefit. That's the classic direction of treatment effect that we see. However, in antithrombotic therapies, we've seen that not be true in prior studies because in the highest risk of thrombotic events and death is also the highest risk for bleeding. So when that happens, in those cases like ATLAS II and other trials, when we've seen that not to be the case, where not always the highest risk patients or not always the highest dose of treatment work best was really because there was a washout effect by the bleeding complications that happened in the highest risk patients. Interestingly, in Patrick's trials, this did not seem to be the case. Uh, bleeding was not the reason for why the uh, anticoagulation therapy did not work in the highest in the highest uh, risk group. So that makes me wonder a little bit, why was that happened then? Because it was not washed out by the bleeding. And on the same, at the same time, what always worried me, not only on Patrick's study, but in my own study and other studies is that when we do these trials in an open label fashion, there is ascertainment bias. There is, um, it's impossible to not have it because physicians are there treating patients. And when you have outcomes like need of oxygen and need of or length of stay in the hospital, which is completely subjectively collected or defined based on physicians' decisions in an open label study. And when this is driving the results, I get nervous because there is bias included in that. And that's why, of course, I'm looking forward to see the full paper from Patrick's study, uh, 
but I have to deal with that in our own action study. Uh, and you can blind adjudicate it, but you don't take, even if you blind the adjudication, you don't take care of the ascertainment bias to begin with. And I think that is a major problem of doing, or major challenge of doing trials in a pandemic where you have to treat patients, deal with expectations, doing how investigators report events and things like that. So basically, I think this is just something that I think people need to keep in mind when interpreting all these results and directions of, 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 of results and et cetera. And because of that, um, I haven't treated like Scott, everyone in the award with full dose happen. I still think there is room for further um, define and further refine who might get, who might not get that. Um, I think definitely DOAX I'm not using at all uh, as a therapeutic drug, but I think prophylaxis is still a very reasonable option. It's still because I feel weird when you have to keep it therapeutic in the ward and then people get sicker and then you have to downgrade to prophylactic is a little bit not sense or not so much common. Uh, as we expected. So I think there, there is room for therapy to uh, happen, but I'm not sure yet if it's for everyone mm -hmm. or if we can figure out which might be the best group of patients that might get that treatment. Great. Yeah, Thank so you. Renato, so I did just, yeah, I mean, I, I jump started that. I said everyone just, uh, I mean, if the patient has red stuff coming out of them, if they don't have platelets or those things, I usually don't do that. <laughs> Good. So um, thank you. Uh, so it sounds like, you know, you're still ready, waiting for um, to get a better sense of how we identify the folks who would benefit most from full dose anticoagulation on the ward um, versus prophylaxis. You um, just touched on a question that did come up, which is if you do choose to give someone on the ward full dose anticoagulation for prevention or for to, with the hopes of improving outcome, do you then change the dose when they're transferred to the ICU, knowing the data showing that there does not appear to be benefit of full dose anticoagulation um, in those patients? Again, these are all patients who do not have at least overt macro thrombosis, right, that we're talking about. So um, what's the approach there? Are you supposed to step it down um, when they get transferred to the ICU or do you just continue um, on the full dose anticoagulation? Scott, what, do you, what have you been doing? Well, I'm gonna let Patrick uh, lead this, but what we did in the trial is that we, um, is that we continued that. So a, a patient was on the floor and they went up to the ICU. Of course, remember, we didn't have the re trial results at that time also. We were uh, uh, continuing. Uh, Patrick and I have chatted is that is a huge uh, subgroup of patients that we want to uh, analyze once the uh, full, you know, the manuscripts uh, get out and to uh, look at that. I don't, I don't know. What I do if, if, if I have my patient up there though, is I have that conversation uh, with the accepting critical care doc just so we can, you know, chat about it. I don't think there's a right or wrong answer. The, the short answer is I don't know. Yeah, I completely agree with Scott. That's very well said. In the MPRCT, those patients started on the ward and went to the ICU were still analyzed as moderate. So the definition of illness severity was at baseline and not through treatment, obviously. Um, so the best we can say is that that's how they were currently analyzed. That being said, I will also point out that the rate of, as you say, detectable macro thrombosis is quite high in the ICU already. Um, and so the ind independent indication for anticoagulation may already exist in a number of those patients. And similarly, the risk of bleeding, as Renato said, is also high in that population. So in some cases, the decision's made for you. Um, but with respect to the absence of those, what do you do? The trial data can't tell us. I will say there's an ongoing uh, adaptation of remap cap, which is from the International Adaptive Platform Trials that participated in the MPRCT that's looking at that specific question, taking patients that have at least 48 hours of anticoagulation reward and randomize them to continuation or discontinuation if they get to the ICU. And Tracy, just one comment that I wanted to just also mention that Patrick made a point, which I think is very important and Scott also mentioned. Uh, and we also have seen that in action, which is we knew that D-dimer is a great marker of risk, but we always knew based on every trial in the past that it's not a driver of treatment. Uh, we never treated anyone just because of D-dimer. We know it's a marker, but it's not a risk factor. Um, uh, in other words, it's a marker that patients are gonna do worse, but it's not gonna be driving the decision on treatment. And we've seen a lot of patients, particularly in the outpatient setting, 
with high D dimers and being put on DOAX or any kind of anticoagulants in all crazy doses for basically treating D dimer, not treating patients. And I think the platform trials and action study confirm that the treatment effect is not influenced at all by the level of D dimer. And I think that's a very powerful message. Keep, so we have almost three, more than 300 people. So keep treating patients and not D dimers, please. So, so let me just ask on the heels of that, because we got a little bit of conflicting input there. So should you even be monitoring D-dimer? Do you feel like we wouldn't be using this in our um, decision-making? I, I know it's not clearly in an algorithm, like if this, then that. I think Scott showed nicely that, that um, um, that's not what we're doing, but should we be folding this in at all and using this to help us figure out whether we would be using a higher intensity of anticoagulation or not? And it sounds like you're saying no, Renato. Yeah, I, yeah okay. I'm saying that you can use the dimer just like use any other markers that will help you to figure out the risk of the patient and therefore how, ca how cautious you have to be, how aggressive you have to be in terms of overall treatment, but not to decide if you're going to treat patients with an anticoagulant versus not, or with a higher dose versus not. It's just part of a, of a risk assessment right. that is not modifiable, but you can get a sense of the risk of your patient, but not to decide who gets treated and who does not get treated. Right. So it helps us with the risk of decompensation in COVID and, and things getting worse, but not to drive our anticoagulant decisions. That's exactly. my view. I wonder what, Matt, what Patrick thinks and what I'm yeah. I'm completely in line with what Renato is saying. I think, you know, really the key concept is to think about it as if you do want to use it to individualize the care discussion with the patient, you can use it for, to inform absolute risk assessment because absolute risk assessment obviously relates to what the benefit will be in an individual patient. Although the relative risks may not differ, the absolute risks do differ. That being said, I would suspect that if you checked a troponin, if you checked a CRP, if you checked a number of other <laughs> male, older patients, that you'd have the same thing as D-dimer. So I don't think, you know, as much as we thought that it was a marker of intravascular thrombosis that would give us a precision readout for which patient needs anticoagulation, I don't think it's proven to be that. I think it's just proven to be a risk marker. And I think part of the reason that that's the case, you know, D-dimer obviously sort of may reflect also extravascular coagulation due to capillary leak in the lungs and tissue factor binding. Um, we see the same thing, obviously, in hereditary angioedema without an increased risk of thrombosis. So I, I think it's a multifactorial kind of marker. And I think as Renato says exactly, it's a marker of absolute risk, just like anything else. Um, just a switching gear. Oh, go ahead, Benu. Just, just one comment, if I may. I completely agree with all that is being said. The only other piece that I occasionally do is in the right context. It might be a driver of doing right diagnostic testing. And then if you do confirm thrombosis, then you have a reason to use fully therapeutic anticoagulation. Right, so it's just kind of a jogger to remember, hey, look at the legs, think about if there's a change from a pulmonary status, that kind of thing. Okay, that, I think that makes sense. Um, a question about the INSPIRATION trial. Any comment on the low rates of thrombosis seen in the ICU uh, in comparison to previous reports, especially earlier on in the pandemic? Um, that This might be a can of worms here, for, but I'm curious to see um, what you're thinking about that. Of course. I think that's a very interesting and important question. Part of it is puzzling to us as investigators as well, but a couple of uh, potential explanations. One is, I guess, over time, the thrombosis event rates went down even outside of our study. There was a systematic review meta-analysis that got published, I think, earlier this year, showed that there's an inverse association between size of the studies and the thrombotic events rates being reported. If, if you look back early on, Many of the studies were reporting extremely high event rates, then it went down. That being said, it still doesn't account for the full differences. The other part could be potential ascertainment. That's part of the reason all cause mortality, which is in some ways the ultimate outcome was part of our composite. When in fact, we looked at the use of diagnostic tests between the two groups, there was not a significant difference. And the proportion of people who got tested versus people who did have uh, diagnosed thrombotic events was more than four to one. So even though we cannot exclude under diagnosis, I'm not entirely convinced that was the whole answer. So in essence, I think it remains an interesting observation, but I don't think that would uh, take away the ultimate message of lack of benefit that we observed with intermediate dose anticoagulation. Is there any thought that uh, steroids, the use of um, steroids could have been playing a role there? That, that's another great question, and I saw that 
my great, great friend and colleague, David Jimenez, had raised that question as well. I, I think for that, we need additional sub-analyses from these trials and inspiration, but did not see an interaction. But also I would be very curious to see what happened in the steroid trials. Take recovery as an example. I haven't seen the full results reported for thrombotic events in their two arms. I would be very curious to see if steroids reduce the rate of thrombotic events. There's gonna be lots of limitations for a postdoc analysis, but that, that's a very interesting question because the vast majority of people in these recent anti-thrombotic therapy trials did receive steroids. That might've mitigated the thrombotic event rate. Uh, let's well, talk sorry. a little bit, oh, go ahead. Tracy, I'm so sorry. To, um, I think it's a, it's really a phenomenal question, and at least in the MPRCT, we'll we'll certainly look at that and do our best to to tease out other potential confounders. I think one of the big ones, though, that will be hard to overcome is the effect of time. Is um, obviously the use of steroids kind of ramped up over the late summer and obviously became standard of care by the fall. Um, other factors changing disease epidemiology, variants, and other factors will have just changed in parallel with that. And it may be hard to control for that in post hoc analyses. But, but certainly in terms of mechanisms of blunting the upfront immunothrombotic cascade with direct anti-inflammatory effects, I, I think there's a lot of rationale to think that that might be a, something that reduces the efficacy of anticoagulants. I don't say that with any specific data, but just intuitively, I agree. Um, thank you. Uh, let's, let's talk about post-discharge. Um, and uh, there's a couple of questions about uh, post-discharge and what to do there. So um, if you were to offer anticoagulation to someone post-discharge, how do you identify that person that would benefit from it? Are you using, I'm gonna ask this, you already said no, but would you be using D-dimer at that point um, to help guide that, that, that decision? Um, and, uh, and then if you can talk a little bit about the studies that that are ongoing looking uh, at this question? I can take a, stab, a first step on this one. So uh, I think the answer, the basically answer is that we don't know. Uh, if you extrapolate from the Mariner trial, which was medically ill patients, not COVID, but medically ill patients where a lot of those were infections, you could potentially expand, extend the treatment with uh, lower dose of rivaroxaban, just like was done in the Mariner trial by calculating the improved score by the time of discharge and go with that for 35 days or so. Uh, that's approved in the US. That's not approved in other countries as an extended uh, thromboprophylaxis strategy. Um, having said that, uh, particularly in COVID, we don't know. In action, I think is the closest that we have from extending after hospital discharge so far published and we've seen zero effects. But there are some trials ongoing. We are about to finish the Michel trial. It's called Michel trial. And the Michel trial is basically a Mariner-like trial, but all on COVID. So patients who got hospitalized without a thrombotic event. At the time of this trial, we calculate the risk score and we randomize patients to continue with prophylaxis with roxaban 10 milligrams or no. And we're going to be assessing events at 35 days, clinical events, and angio CT in everyone. And I think that's going to be very important because you take care, it, it, you take away the ascertainment bias that you might be seeing, you know, in an open label trial. So that trial is expected to be presented around the ESC end of August. So let's hope we can wrap that up and present that result that is coming soon. And of course, the NIH is doing the 4C trial, the active 4C trial, which is again is an extension treatment with a NOAC. Uh, very similar to the Mariner design. So those data are coming in the second half of the year. Stay tuned, lots to come. Okay. Hey, Renato, you. are you using an improved D uh, for your risk assessment? Yeah. In that trial? Yeah. yeah. Right. With, with the D-dimer, with the improved score with the D-dimer? We are using, yeah, it's a modified improved D, yes. Correct. Yes, right. Okay, so thank you. So. Um, I think that's that's helpful for folks to check. That's a very muddy area, uh, and I think it's really a challenge. You know, when you are on the wards, just looking at the patient, trying to decide what to do and the risk benefit uh, between that. There are a lot of questions coming in about antiplatelets, and I know that we are not you. None of you are specifically talking about that in the trials that you're doing right now. But I think in the real world, there's a lot of questions about um, the potential role for this. Be it adding to a prophylactic dose in the hospital offering it for prophylaxis after discharge, offering it to patients who have been diagnosed with COVID and are not yet hospitalized. Um, so I'm just gonna ask, 
what you all think about this and um, if you want to mention what's happening with the uh, current trials in this area. So maybe I'll start first if I may. So I think uh, of the trial results that are already out, uh, Martin Landry was sharing the preprint for recovery aspirin substudy, not a substudy, randomized trial. And those results did not meet the primary outcome. We are gonna be enthusiastic to see how the full results look like. In the ICU substitute patients, there are trials that are randomizing to aspirin, not to my knowledge, results are back. And clopidogrel among other P2Y12 inhibitors are also being studied in some smaller and some larger studies. Again, I don't think there are any studies that are completed and the results have been disseminated. It's hypothetically very interesting, but I, I think it's not ready for prime time before we have trial results. Hey, Patrick, just before we get to the uh, top of the hour, do you just want to mention the antiplatelet? Uh, sure. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Scott, that's fantastic. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, the active uh, 4A program, which is the inpatient uh, NIH, NHLBI um, trial looking at antithrombotics in COVID patients, has now pivoted from anticoagulants to antiplatelet agents and is randomizing the P2I12 inhibitor or usual care, both in the moderate and the severe disease state. Um, if anyone's interested, obviously, please send uh, myself or Scott an email. I'd be happy to connect you. Uh, Remap CAP is also looking uh, in mostly in the ICU, but also in, in the moderate state to some extent that. P2Y12 inhibitors uh, and is randomizing actively as well. So there should be some more data um, also to support this question. It's a great one. But and interesting there, there in is, that NIH trial, it's going to add a P2Y12 on top of therapeutic anticoagulation uh, on the quote floor and prophylactic dose in the ICU. Correct. And that's correct. And that's nice of the adaptive design of all these trials. And it's really cool that you can keep testing things uh, and, and just there have been some recent data more mechanistically and looking at platelet activation in COVID that show really no, um, no activation of platelet uh, activity uh, as we thought it would be as part of the cytokine storm and et cetera. So of course, the ultimately will be the, the, the outcome data showing, um, showing the final answer. But it's funny to see one year after the pandemic how things are changing completely in the way things are proven to be in one way or the other, very different than initially thought in the beginning of the pandemic. One more reason to don't try to guess on treating patients. Let's enroll them in the trials. That's the best way to treat a patient when you don't know how to do so. Great. Um, thank you. These were a phenomenal, phenomenal discussion. Um, before we close, I just want to remind people uh, that the Anticoagulation Forum website has a lot of resources on COVID and uh, anticoagulation. So really encourage you all to take a look there. And I'll turn it back over to Darren. And uh, All right. Thank, thank you, you Tracy. Thank you all. So you can see my screen okay, everyone? Yes. Tracy. All right. So um, thank you very much. Just a reminder to everyone in our audience, if you're interested in acquiring CE credit to um, follow up with the link here. And um, that is for providers, pharmacists and nurses. So we appreciate um, the opportunity to provide that to you. I also want to remind you that um, we have another uh, webinar scheduled for July um, with speakers, Dr. Jordan Schaefer and Jeffrey Barnes speaking about combination aspirin and DOAC therapy, another hot topic that we know is of, of great interest to all of you. Another um, opportunity for you to learn and interact um, with, with the subject matter experts is our live conference. So we are doing the conference again. It is in October in San Francisco. We are hosting you know, live attendees, live speakers, but there will also be a virtual option if you cannot join us in person. So we very much encourage you to, uh, to take part in the conference in uh, whatever and whichever way you possibly can. Um, so we can continue these sorts of uh, wonderful dialogues around these very, very high, high priority topics. Uh, I do want to take a moment on behalf of Liz Goldstein and Anticoagulation Forum to thank um, everyone who was involved today, particularly Drs. Lopez, Lawler, and uh, Big Deli. Thank you so much for um, giving us an inside look into the, into the phenomenal research and, and the effort um, that you've all carried out in your respective studies. I want to thank Dr. Minicello and Kate uh, for serving as the monitors today. And then also all of um, our members and participants, we had people from Canada, the US, at least Costa Rica, and uh, Dr. Lopez from Brazil. So it's just amazing to have the opportunity to um, have everyone come together. 
And all of this um, would not be made possible uh, without the support of our corporate sponsors. So we very much appreciate that as well. So we invite you to the conference, to the next webinar, and to visit our resource center for um, ongoing, you know, posted, updated resources relating to COVID and to other topics. So thank you all. Anything else, Dr. Cates or Tracy? No. Thank you. Right. And thanks thank to you, our guest speakers. All Bye. right. Good goodbye, all.